Uh, tonight's shir, <clears throat> in a certain sense, is really about two themes, although they're really connected, and that's really why I put them together, you know? And that is that, you know, we just passed Tisha B'Av on Thursday, right? And um, the essential concept of Tisha B'Av, of course, is mourning. We mourn. We grieve. That's really what it's all about. It's about grieving about the loss that we have. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I wanted to point out certain very interesting things. <clears throat> now together with that, what I want to do is combine what is happening today. You know, people walk around, they're very confused, obviously. In many ways, they're very dismayed. Because the world looks like it completely went insane, obviously. <clears throat> what is astounding about what is going on today is several ideas. The first idea is the changes that have occurred. It's astounding. You know, these changes are not merely changes, but they are destructive. They are sinful. They are immoral, unethical, whatever you want to call, you see. That's the first idea which is very important to note. The second thing which is very interesting is that these changes have occurred with incredible speed. In the last two and a half years since Biden took office, America has seriously severely deteriorated. In fact, America is no longer the country that I knew or anybody else knew who uh, you know, comes from America. That's the same country. You know, they, they have proposed and they exhibit insane ideas. You know, we, we're all familiar, you know, in terms of transgender, LGBTQ, I hope everybody knows what that is. You know, as homosexuals and so on. Then you gotta be careful of how you address the person you know, you got to use the proper pronoun. It's insane, you know. Then there's transgender, transgender. Then the educational system is absolutely incredible. Trying to convince seven-year-old kids, well, why do you have to be a boy or girl? You can change it, you know. It, 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 when you look at what's happening, this is not merely, like I say, merely immoral, sinful, and so on. It is destructive of civilization. These are deal breakers. For what? For civilization. That's what's so astonishing. So it's the type of change and it's the speed of the change. How could all this have happened in two, two and a half years? You know, this should have taken hundreds of years. You don't become this way in two and a half years, especially America. Because America, it was always a moral country. It had the right values. Not, you know, not so much religious values, but it had the right social values you know, that would encourage a civilization to flourish, obviously. And now we look at it, it's astounding, you see. So everybody's wondering, what in the world is going on? Right? What is it that is going on? I've spoken about this in the past, you know, but I want to bring certain ideas, you know, which will hopefully clarify to a much greater extent what is happening. Now, I include not just America, but also Israel. We are watching something happen in Israel, which is very dangerous. Because what is happening, the possibility of what is happening can destroy Israel. We're not looking here at a difference of opinion, you know, no. We're looking at a value system that can be destroyed, can be, can be, can be uh, destructive, you know, Israel, in many ways, in certain ways, has become a country of two different people. You see, you call it the right and the left. But it's not only the right and the left. It's that nobody wants to tolerate the other person. I find it interesting that the parallels between America and Israel are stunning. You see, it's not merely that people differ. Either, neither side or either side won't tolerate the other side. You see, you can have a difference of opinion, 
but you can still respect the other person's posture or position. Here, people hate each other, and that's the same thing in America. So we are looking, this, this by the way is the way, I'm not saying it will happen, but this is the way civil wars start. When there's a serious rift in the country, and then it grows and grows, and all of a sudden, one side says, you know, we've had enough of you. You know, we think it's a great idea to split, right? You take one side, we'll take the other side. That's exactly what happened in America. And the result was 700,000 people died, and they really split the country. The Roshim was Murachim. God had tremendous mercy. I once spoke about this, about America in the Civil War, you see. So he appointed, or he made sure that Lincoln, which had almost no chance of being president, by the way, we don't realize that. I mean, Lincoln really is the greatest president in, in, in American history. There's no question about that. Because he saved the Union, as they say, you know. But he was very unlikely to win, which is really very interesting and so on, you know. But of course, we know that God runs the show. It's irrelevant what everybody else wants, right? The only vote that counts is God's vote. Everybody else's is absolutely irrelevant, which is interesting, how God m makes it look like your vote count, uh, whatever. But that, that's the Ramana Shalom. You know, someday when the Mashiach comes, he's going to take credit for all of this. And right now we don't realize what's going on. But these are the things that astonish us. And not only do they astonish us, but it's dangerous. This country is in a sakana, really is, you know. There are people that are advocating for what? They're advocating for the overthrow of the government now, you see. Which of course is, it's not only anarchy, right? But it's an insurrection. The old word for it used to be treason. It's really what it is. It's called insurrection. And guess what? These people can be tried for treason. It's exactly what it is. In America, same thing. Biden, it's get, every day is worse and worse, where he obviously the guy and his family enriched themselves in bribery. Yeah, but wait a minute, he's getting bribes from where? Communist China. That's an enemy of America. That's called treason. So Biden is not only guilty of taking bribes, he's guilty of treason, which if I remember correctly, is a death penalty, and so on, you know? So we're looking at the greatest scandal in American history. The president should take, I think he pocketed $30 million or something like that. Whatever the latest figures are. Just, it's just astounding what this guy has done, you know. And so really, we live in an astonishing time. And that's what I want to talk about. What all this really means. <coughs> But in order to understand what is really going on, you need an understanding, really, of what mourning is, what Tisha B'Av really was about. And there will be some startling concepts which most people are unaware of, right? And that's what's very important. Okay, <clears throat> first idea. <clears throat> the Rabbanu Shalom, God, created five realities. By the way, I'm now going to tell you the essential concept of Judaism, what it really is, right? I'm going to tell it to you in brief, but it's going to really be the exact concept of what Judaism is. You will understand it from a different perspective, much higher perspective, or maybe a much deeper perspective, you see. And normally if you walk over to somebody and say to them, what is Judaism about? I mean, Judaism is a religion, whatever. What is the essential nature of Judaism? Most people, I would imagine, will say, well, what it's really about is mitzvahs. Before I continue, I just want to read this. 
this year should be a merit. This year should be a blessing and a merit for the health and success of the families of Regina Bas Yosef Ruven and Yeshaya Ben Yisrael, Benjamin Wolf, Ben Tzvi Hersh, and Baruch Ben Benjamin Wolf. They should all, you know, be successful in the schus of the Shriya. Also, it should be for the alias neshama of Frida Chaya Bela Bas Yitzchak Tzvi. And the Shema should have an aliyah in the merit of the Shia. Amen. Yeah, so if most people answer, the essence of Judaism is the mitzvahs, right? It is the 613 commandments, right? That's really what it is, Matan Torah, that's really what, right? But I'll tell you something interesting. If that's what you think, you're really wrong. Not that you're wrong, wrong, right? But you are superficial. That's not really what it's about, you see. And you will understand exactly, uh, you know, what I say and so on. In any case, <coughs> the Rabbani Shalom, God, created five realities. And we'll understand what that means. The first reality, which we have absolutely no comprehension about, is the reality called God. Now we have no idea of who he is, what he is, how he is, nothing. And that's a whole sheer in itself, which I think I once gave years ago, who is God and so on, you know. But there's a very distinct feature in that reality of God, okay? Without getting into too heavy of, about it, you know. And that is the feature called Enoid Muvadoi. God is in uh, the, the, the reality that God is in, actually, which is interesting, God is not part of reality. Sounds funny. Reality is part of God. And I'm not going to elaborate on that, but it has a whole different meaning and so on. God determines what reality is. You can't get more fundamental than that. In any case, <clears throat> but one of the things about the Rabbanu Shalom, in wherever he is, wherever he is, as it says in the Kedusha, uh, where is his place that we can praise him and so on? Nobody knows. No, nobody has absolutely any idea of where the Rabban Shalom is, what he is and so on. But one of the major features, in fact, in this week's Pasha, this week's Pasha is where Shanon, right? And this week's Pasha, it says an interesting Pasha. Very profound. You have been shown that you may know. Hashem Olokim, the Lord God is the Lord, which means the master, the director, the boss, in common uh, parlance. Besides him, there's nothing else. Notice it doesn't say there's nobody like him. It says Enoid Mulvadoi. Besides him, there's nothing else. You see, and that's uh, mamish, literally, not figuratively. Now, I'm not going to explain that. That's another sheer and so on and so forth. But that's a very important idea. That the only thing in the reality of God is that he's the only thing that exists. If you want to understand what that means, right? For instance, if I asked you, what did God create? Right? Because he created, he, he, uh, Bracious is all about the creation, which means he made things out of nothing. But you ever ask yourself, well, what did he make? You see? So we all normally assume that what God made is objects. Right? He made everything. And there are trillions and trillions of things. We talk about the whole universe, the whole creation, the angels, everything he made. Right? <clears throat> but the truth is, he made mu much more than just objects. He made concepts. For instance, we say that God is a Rachamim, which he is. He's compassionate, mercy. But do you know that mercy is a created concept? It doesn't exist with God. That's what Enoid Mervada means. Besides God, there is nothing else. There's no concept. So how in the world can we envision anything about God if there are no concepts that exist Besides him, you see, he has to create the concept called Rachamim, mercy, 
and then he assumes the characteristic of mercy. It's very, it's incredible when you think about that. Now, I don't want to go you know, too much into that, but that's how deep is the concept of Enoid Muvadoy. That nothing exists, any concept, in fact, in last week's Haftarah, we are me to damyuni, Yomar Kodesh. And to who can you compare me? To what can you compare me? And I will be, says the Holy One. What does that mean? That means there's absolutely no word that is really him. It's a created concept that you can now use to describe him. If he hadn't created it, you could not describe him because you wouldn't even know the concept because it doesn't exist. It's an incredibly sublime idea. <clears throat> now, that's one of the major features of God. Therefore, if you think about that, wait a minute. That means there's no concept called other. There is no other. There's God, and that's it. And even the, So it's not only that there is no other objects and so on. There's no concept called other. So then how can God create? Right? Got that? And the answer is that he created a concept called other. He had to. Because if there's no concept, if there's no potential of other, there cannot be other. And therefore the entire creation can't even begin without that idea. So guess what? He created the concept called Zulosoi. Besides God, there's something else. And it was he created the concept called else. Right? That's what he did. That's to what extent God is. Now, once he creates, so the first reality is God. What is the concept called other? What did he create first? Now that there's an idea called other, that means other can exist besides God. What did he create first? And the answer is, the first thing he created, I'm leaving out the spheres, which are how God makes reality. <clears throat> okay? What he did, the next thing he created is the neshama. The neshama, the soul of man or woman or whatever, the neshama is the greatest thing he ever made. We have no idea what the neshama is. We have no idea. When the angels get close to a being, a neshama, they shake because it's much greater than them, right? You are much greater than the malachim, right? We don't even realize that. And that's why you begin to realize how we treat each other is ridiculous. You know, if we would realize the value, the worth, the greatness of a soul, how could you talk Lashon Arab against another Jew? You don't even, you don't realize who you're talking about. A soul which is infinitely greater than a malach. But we don't realize that. That is concealed from us. Very interesting. So the second reality is the reality of the souls. Zulosoi. That is the other that he created. <clears throat> then God created a third reality. What reality is that? Ruchnius, spirituality. He created all the angels. And they are spiritual. They are not like the neshama. The neshama is divine. That's the difference. The malach is ruchni, is spiritual. You see, there's a big difference, like I said, between a malach and the neshama. But he created an entire creation, a universe of malachim, of angels. There are billions of malachim. Why? Because God does not want to show, initially anyway, that he's the director of everything. So what he did is he created a world, the spiritual world, right, where he can demonstrate that he has intermediaries. So it's the malachim that do everything under God's orders, right? They take their orders from God. But they do it. God does not want to demonstrate that even malachim don't really exist. And he gives them the power to do everything, you see. So that's the third world, the world of the spirit, which is interesting. You know, we think that, well, the, the, the ruchnius, spirituality, is uh, the second, no. The neshama is first, that world, and the second, and the next world, the third world, is the world of spirituality. Then what God did, <clears throat> is he now wants to create a barrier. A barrier where the neshama will not know the realities of God. They it won't know. So he creates what's called physicality. 
And physicality has many different dimensions. You see, for instance, radio waves. It's physical, yet we don't see it, you see, because it's energy. Now, nobody knows what energy is, but it's physical. Energy is a physical reality, right? It happens to be the most subtlest form of physicality, which is true. But it is still physical, right? Just like light. Light is physical, but it is so subtle, we don't see it, and so on. So God created the world of Geshem, physicality. What I'm telling you is don't be mistaken, physicality has many, many different degrees, if you want to look at it that way. And he takes, creates a physical being, and he inserts an ishama into that phys physical lavush, clothing. It's really what it is. It's a costume, right? That the neshama is now in, and it cannot break out by the decree of God. Why does God do that? Because it wants to create a barrier. He wants to create a barrier where since we are physical, we do not perceive, not only we do not perceive the world of God, we do not perceive the world of spirit at all. We don't see malachim, right? Obviously, if you do, you're a great candidate for psychiatric consultation, right? But we do not experience the, the spiritual at all. In any case, so God creates the physical as a barrier because he wants the neshama in that body to be able to discover the reality of the divine. That's what he wants. So obviously, he's going to start him off, right, with a big uncertainty. Now, who was the first one who did that? Who was the first guy that showed up as a physical person? Or the Mauritian, the first man, right? He's the first guy, and he shows up, and so on. And th this is what we see, right? But remember, Adam was physical. What happened? Adam sinned with Chava, his wife. They both sinned. They ate from a tree that they were commanded not to eat, which we know the story and so on. That's what they did. But wait, what happened? Because I mentioned how many realities are there. There's the world of reality of God, the soul, the spirit, and the physical. But there is a fifth reality. It is called the satanic reality. It's the world of the Satan. The Satan is a malach that inhabits a very low reality, but it's a reality distinct from the physical. We're not familiar with it yet. Actually, we are in a certain sense. And that reality was separate from the physical. What Adam did is that when he sinned, he allowed the, the world of the Satan to merge with the mm -hmm. world of Geshem. <coughs> so now the reality that he lives in, Adam, is the world called Geshem Zoyamo. Zoyamo means the pollution the, the uh, contamination. Zoyama is a force, right? That in, it's like energy in our world. In the world of the Sutton, it's called Zoyama. It is a force that the Sutton can project. And that's how he enters every human form. And you walk around with him in your mind as the Eight Sahara. You see. <clears throat> but the Zoyama is very interesting. The problem with the Zoyama is that it will kill you. What is the essence of the Sutton? The essence of the Sutton, right, is called decomposition. He wants to remove, he wants to disassemble everything. That's what he does. He's an expert. He's called the demolition expert. That's what he is. That's why God told all the Mauritian, on the day that you eat of this tree, you will die. Because death is the ultimate decomposition, right? Uh, unra unraveling of life. But what's interesting is not only all living things deteriorate and ultimately die, but even the world itself deteriorates. There's a second law of thermodynamics called the law of entropy, which says that if you have an energy, a certain level of energy in a room, and you leave it alone, then that energy will lower and dissipate, and so on. Well, what is that? That's decomposition of energy. Same thing except it occurs to inorganic matter as opposed to organic matter. You see, in other words, the world that Autumn created, which is a tremendous mistake, is that he allowed the world of the Satan to merge with Geshem. So now Autumn Mauritian is not pure Geshem anymore. He is now Geshem 
Zoyama. And therefore, he is now subject to death, disease, right? All kinds of negative experiences. It's all the world of the Sutton. And we just take a look outside. It's all satanic and so on. And this was the result of Adam Rishan's sin, because he sinned and so on. Now, therefore, that changed. What the Bhagavad wanted is that Adam Rishan should do this. He wanted him to remain Geshem, physical, without the Zoyama, right? And that Adam Rishan should begin to discover in ways that the Bhagavad arranged the true realities of God and so on. That's what he wanted. But so what? Because here's what would have happened. And this is the key to Judaism. Had Adam Arishan not done the sin, then his body, which was physical, but it wasn't the same physicality as us, obviously, because he had no Zoyama in him. This was before the sin. So if he has no Zoyama, he's not subject to death. He lives forever, right? There's no disease. Everything is phenomenal. Nothing is bad, right, in his world. But what God wanted him to do is to realize the divine, the true realities of the spirit and the divine and so on, which he, which he failed. So what did the Rav say? What would have happened had he done that? Then his body, which was physical, would have become Ruchni, right? His physical body, not his Neshama, because Neshama was incredible. But his physical body would have changed you see, and become like a malach. And it would have proceeded. And it, it would take a couple of thousand years, which I'm not going to go into. And then all of a sudden, he would no longer be spiritual, right? He would be divine. And he would be a pure nishama in Ilam Habo. We don't know what the future world is. But it is not a world of angels, really. It is a world that you need to be a divine being Zulasoi, in order to be there, you see. We have no idea. And that is the appropriate world that the Neshama, at its inception, would have inhabited. But God subjected it to a test, right, where he enwrapped it in physicality. But ultimately, when the Neshama in the body does the mitzvahs, and Adam Rishon had the first mitzvah, he would have changed. Realities would have gone from the lowest to the highest. That's the essence of Judaism. That is called tikkun, rectification. In which what God wants is that the soul should rectify the realities that it inhabits. You see? So initially it was Geshem, physicality, and had he done the mitzvah, he would have changed into a higher world which is spiritual. In Kabbalah it's called Olam Yitzira. Then that would have gone into a higher world called Olam Bria. You see, until he would have left the spiritual and he would have entered which is for divine beings. You see? And that world is beyond comprehension. Like it says in the Gemara, the eye has never beheld what, the, uh, what, um, what is stored up for the righteous in the future world. It's a different reality. There's no spirituality there. You see, there's no physicality. Forget about the Zoyama. That's certainly God, right? But there is the world of the divine. And it's not our world. We have no idea. It is beyond belief uh, be reality. I like to say, to say it's very simple, right? It is infinite bliss eternally. Right? That's what it is. That's what it is to be a Zulosai, of which we basically all are. In any case, but since Adam Rishan introduced the Zoyama, right? He introduced the Zoyama. So therefore, you can't do that anymore. The body cannot change, no matter how many mitzvahs you do. Why? Because zikoch, to purify the body, is what he should have done. But if the body is now inhabited by the Zoyama, you cannot purify Zoyama. You gotta get rid of it. You know, imagine you move into a house, right? And you, the former tenant left all his garbage furniture. So you can't decorate the house at all. You gotta get rid of the junk furniture. Same idea. Before you can begin to change, you need to get rid of the Zoyama. That's the tikkun that we are involved in. To get rid of Odom Arishan's Zoyama. Then we become like Odom Arishan before the sin. You see? 
And the question then is, when is that going to happen? And the answer is, that is the Messianic era. Most people don't realize the Messianic era has two parts. The first part, where there's a Mashiach ben Yosef that fights the Zayama. That's what his job really is, to get rid of the Zayama. That's what he does. Okay, without getting into too much detail. But Mashiach ben Dovid is different because there's no death. Remember Tchiesa Mesim? Right? What does Tchiesa Mesim mean? You get up from the dead. Wait a minute. You get up from the dead. You're not the same guy that died, obviously, because you're not subject to disease or death or anything negative. Then who are you and what are you? And the answer is because Mashiach ben David, right, keeps away or gets rid of the Zoyamah. And therefore the world is different. You become or we become like other Mauritian before the sin. And we have no idea what that was. We don't know. Because we do not know what a world is without Zoyama. Very interesting. So therefore the essence of Judaism is tikkun, to change realities. That's what it is. The only thing is Odd Mauritian introduced a fifth reality. Well, actually he didn't create the reality, but he mixed it together with the physical, which is the fourth reality, right? Immediately barring the ability of the neshama to begin to change the body. It is the body that changes and becomes ultimately translucent where only the soul now emerges and so on. So this is what happened. So the, that's, what the, that's what Judaism really is. What do we begin to see? Very important uh, uh, description. We now understand Judaism is really where the Rabbanu wants us to change reality from physical with Zoyama, get rid of the Zoyama, and then in the Moisa Mashiach, you will be physical, right? And then once there's no Zoyama in your body, then God will unleash the mitzvahs that you did, right? And then the Neshama grows because of that, and all of a sudden has the power to purify the body. And it goes from one reality to the next until you wind up in Olam Habo. That's it. That's what Judaism is. So what you realize is that the mitzvah is really a trigger. It's an enabler, you see, of the neshama to purify the body. But it's not the purpose. You know what I'm saying? The purpose is tikkun, done through the mitzvah. You see? That's what really is Judaism is really all about. Look, it's a much different conception than more, what most people have. But this is the bottom line. Okay. Now, <clears throat> but that's tragic. What Otto Mauritian did is tragic. Because he introduced to himself, he became Zoyama physical. So he died, obviously. But he invested all of that stuff into everybody else. So now we're all carrying around the Zoyama, right? And it wreaks havoc with us, as anybody knows. Uh, that's what life is. Life is to deal with the Zoyama, right? Uh, and so on, right? Mm, you know, imagine in a world that there is no Zoyama, there's no doctors, there's no hospitals, nothing negative ever happens. It's a beyond belief world, which is perfect. That's what Zoyama has done, destroyed the uh, tranquility of what the world could have been. Okay, that's the reality. Therefore, what do we see? What was the first tragedy? And really, what is tragedy? Okay, where do we learn the concept of tragedy? It's interesting. I don't think many people realize this. Where do we learn the concept of, who spelled out what tragedy is? What? Very good, Kayan, exactly. Why? Because Kayan said it. He said, after he killed his brother, right? He, he said, God him in soy that my sin is greater than I can bear, right? And he listed a couple of ideas, but one of them is umi ponecho esoser, and from your face I will be concealed or hidden. It means you're gonna hide yourself from me. What is Kain saying? Rihuk. And he realized that that's the greatest tragedy of all. When God says, you know, what you did is terrible, I'm leaving you. I'm gonna have you go on your own. Obviously, you can't go on your own, right? Without God's input, you vanish, you see? And Cain realized that the greatest tragedy of all, right, is Rihok from God. And that's why he says, 
and from your face I will be concealed. You think about that, what does this have to do with Cain? But Cain was a much greater being, the person that we imagine. That's why it's so tragic. And he spelled out exactly what the tragedy is of God, leaving God, or rather God leaving us. You see? So what do we realize? Something which is shocking. Tishabov. When was the first Tishabov? Rosh Hashanah. Think about that. All right? Rosh Hashanah is when Adam Rishon was created and he destroyed the world in its previous form. Think about that. That's Tishabov. Right? That's really what it is. We don't think of it that way. But he introduced a measure in the world that was incredibly bad because he introduced negativity, damage, decomposition to the world, pain, suffering, agony, anguish. I don't want to, can't spell it out more than that. That was his product. You can't mourn more than that, right? Uh, but the cause of all this is because since we introduced the satanic force of Zoyama, that was Rechuk. All of a sudden, God, I'm out of here. You see? Because the Zoyama and I cannot survive together, which is interesting. That's why if you're Tome, Tuma, by the way, what is Tuma? It's an interesting concept, Tuma. Tuma, I will tell you, is really Zoyama, but on the surface. It's surface Zoyama. We are pervaded by Zoyama even though you don't realize that. But the surface of the Zoyama is, Zoyama saturates the body. Right, and you can't measure it because it's a spiritual force, right? Uh, but wait a minute, can you get rid of it? Because really the Rebbe and the Zoyama cannot tolerate each other. That's why you have matter and antimatter. That's the analog of this. So God is matter and the antimatter is the Zoyama. Right? You know what happens when they get together is annihilation. Right? That's really what the analog is. Anyway, so therefore, God cannot tolerate Tumah. That's why if you are Tomei, you cannot go into the Beis HaMikdash. Because the Shekhinah was in the Beis HaMikdash, and you're Tomei, right? You can't go in. What God did is very interesting. He said, okay, obviously then how in the world can you go into a Beis HaMikdash? So what, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to allow you to remove the Zoyama from the, your surface. It'll be in you, but at least it won't be on your surface. And now you can walk into the base of Migdash. That's what Tumah is. Tumah is surface Zoyama, which can be removed by a mikveh, paraduma, whatever. Therefore, we can now associate with God. Isn't that interesting? That's really what it is. Now you understand the origin of the whole concept of Tumah and so on. That's why it exists. Because when you look at Taharas, which is the Mishnaic tractates of Tumah, Tumah Vatara, it's unbelievable, this concept of Tumah, that it travels, it has an origin. I don't want to get into all the laws. And say, what is this? What kind of reality is Tumah? You know? And a woman becomes Tomei once a month. She has to go to the mikveh. Men become Tomei, and so on. Excuse me, what does Tumah have to do with religion? Right? You know, if, you, there's no religion in the world that has the concept of a tumor force. And the answer is, well, guess what? That's what the Zoyama is. That's exactly what Adam Rishon did. You see? But what God did is a chesed that he allowed us the, the ability to remove the surface Zoyama. So now it's inside. Okay, now you can go into the base of Migdash. You can cut them and so on. In any case, this is the problem. So the first Tisha Bob is really Rosh Hashanah. That's shocking when you think about that. Right? Why? Because it allowed Zoyama to enter the Bria. Terrible. And therefore, like Cain said, I will be concealed from your face. When you think about it, it's an incredible concept. Okay, now, wait a minute. If that's the case, so what's the main job of the Jew? Because he's got the job. Right? His main job is to do what? Get rid of the Zoyama. Because Zika cannot happen as long as the Zoyama is in you. So we got to get rid of the Zoyama in order to do what? Begin the Neshama, the power to change the physical into spiritual, into the divine. You see? Did that ever happen? Of course it did. Right? Don't shake your head. Of course it did. Where? 
This is the whole concept of Passover. Pesach, right? The, there's an interesting Gemara in Masech the Shabbos. Now remember, it's a Gemara, right? It's not a Zoya, which is so shocking. The Gemara says that when the Jews stood at Har Sinai, now you begin to understand what's going on. Nifsika Zoya Moshel Nochosh. That the Zoya of the Nochosh, of the snake, right? That's a certain, right? Nifsika ceased to operate. Still there, but it no longer had the ability to operate. Amazing. That's what the Jews wore at the Mount Sinai. But that's incredible. You see, they're not human like us. They had Zoyamo, but it wasn't operative. It didn't operate, so therefore it couldn't decompose them. You see, what was the next stage? Had the Jews not done the Cheto Egel, they would have evicted the Zoyamo from the human body. Right. That's what the Gemara, it's a Gemara, it's not a Zoya, right? Nifzika Zoya Moshul Nochosh, that the, the Zoya of the snake, certain, right, stopped operating. That was stage one, you see? So now you understand what the 49 days is. In fact, it says that when you read the uh, Sphira, Zoya, that the Bershom should remove the Zoya, it actually says that in the Tefillah, you see? So what they did for 49 days, they removed the 49 levels of tumor, because it's memteshai tumor, right? And therefore they removed slowly, or they made an operative the zoyama. The problem was when they did the cheto egel, they restored the zoyama. And now we got to go through 4,000 years of misery in order to kick out the zoyama, because that's really what we're doing. They did it by suffering. I don't want to go into how they, how did they do this? Because this is a spiritual task, right? This is not you know, it's not like, a, you know, a, a dig, dig a hole. No. How do you spiritually remove Zoyama, which itself is all spiritual? Sutton. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. If you're interested, I gave a six-part series on my website, TorahThinking.org. There's 575 shurim on that website, TorahThinking.org. And I gave a Passover shear, six installments. That explains the Zoyama what Pesach really is, and so on. In any case, but that's what they did. So we see, therefore, that the Jews were successful, at least initially, in removing the Zoyama. Amazing. But since they did the Chet Egel, they restored it. You see, <clears throat> when was the Chet Egel done? Remember what the first Tisha B'av was, Rosh Hashanah. When is the second Tisha B'av? Shiva Asa B'tamas. Right. The 17th day of Thomas. Because that was the days that the Jews did the Chet Egel, the sin of the golden calf. That was when they did it. Yud Zayin Thomas. And that's when we begin the three weeks. Right? And therefore Moshe Rabbeinu took the Luchas, the tablets, shattered them at the base of the mountain. Right? So what, the, what was the real tragedy? It's not only that uh, the, uh, they did the sin of the golden calf and the, 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 the Luchas we showing us the first tablets were shattered. What really was the problem is they restored the Zoyama. They restored the Zoyama. So guess what? Shiva Asabatamas is the second Tishabov. It's really what it is. We don't realize that. See, we think that Tishabov is worse than everything. No. Rosh Hashanah was the greatest Tishabov, because that was a profound change. And the second greatest Tishabov is Yud Zion Tamas. Right. It's the greatest day of tragedy of, in terms of Judaism because they restored the Zoyama of Odom Arishim. You see? It's amazing when you think about that. So Ziyud Zayin Thomas is the second Tishabov. And then, of course, finally you had the third Tishabov, which is the destruction of the temple itself, which means the removal of the Shekhinah, the divine presence, and that had to go out. Where is God today? Right? Did he leave? No. He moved, got a better apartment. I shouldn't say better, right? Where did he move? Where is the Shekhinah today? The interesting thing about that is God never left the Beis HaMikdash. But what he did is he moved to the outside wall. What is that wall called? The Kaisal. You ever wonder why is it when you go to the Kaisal, you know, if you're Zoycha, you actually feel something. There's a presence there, some type of a presence. You don't know what it is, but it's different. You see, in front of the Kaisal. What is that? That's the Shekhinah 
the remnant of the Shekhinah that God still leaves there. Right, that's really what it is. So the Shekhinah moved to the end or the outside of the Kaisal. You see, now you understand what you're experiencing. You see, that's really what it is. So thank God, at least God is still here, although he's in Golis, just like we, because when he moves from the Evan Shesia to the outside wall, that's, that's the exile of the Shekhinah. But in any case, therefore that's where we're at. Now, what does all this have to do with current events? I've explained, I hope adequately, what Judaism is on a whole different perspective, right? And uh, how we look at Judaism, what it really is, the concept of the neshama, what Oilam Habo really is, the malachim, and so on. But, Yudzayin Thomas, let's go back to that, right? What does that have to do with current events? Okay. July 4th, 1776 right what is July 4th 1776 birthday of America that's when Thomas Jefferson if I remember my history introduced the Declaration of Independence that's considered the birthday of America in fact when astrology astrologers I should say write these charts and they put down the birthday of America as July 4th 1776 right that's what it is now you can ask yourself that's interesting. What was the Hebrew date of July 4th, 1776? Do you know what it was? Shiva Osabatamos. Right. So the question you have to ask yourself, that's interesting. Why? And this woman at Shemayim, obviously, that America was founded, was allowed to remove itself from Britain. All this is incredible hashgocha. Why would the Bershom allow America to be born on Shiva Osabatamos? For us, it's Tishbov, and for them, it's the birth. What's going on here? Very interesting. <clears throat> what we see from here is that there is a connection. There's a connection between, in terms of the avoida of the Jew, Judaism, and America. It's interesting. So therefore, America has to be born on the day, basically, of Tishbov, of the Jews. You know, which we now understand, because that's when the Zoyama re-entered the physical world. But what is that? What's the connection? What seems to have happened is a bunch of 200, more than 200 years ago, is saying, you America will be born on the day of the greatest tragedy. Why? Because in the end of time, right before the Mashiach, America has a responsibility to do what? To straighten out the world. You will provide some type of a tikkun, you see, to the Zoyama. Right? Yeah, it's strange, right? What does that mean? Okay. <clears throat> How much time do I have? As much time as you'd like. Because if you want the full story, it's going to take a while. Okay. Rabbi Moshe Chaim Ritzatoy says, uh, he gives an example, how evil can the world become? How, how bad can it be? Right? And not only that, what is the evil at the end? Because he gives an example. Imagine you're in a house, and there's one window, and that window is painted black. But right now, the bottom window is open. So there's an incredible amount of light that pours in. That light that pours in, right, is the analog of the Shefa of God. That's how the world exists. God has to completely mashpia. He has to send forth a divine energy for the entire existence, creation, to be maintained. If he ever stopped for a nanosecond, even briefer than that, then the entire creation would instantly evaporate. 
instantly. So it needs this constant input from God. So the Ramchal uses an example. So you got this window, it's open. So in the beginning of time, right, this window was open, the bottom half, right, and this light, which is the divine influx of incredible divine energy, was coming in. Great. But as the sins of mankind increase, what was happening? The window started shut, closing. So less and less divine energy enters the world, and therefore, when there's no divine energy, evil dominates. Evil always enters when God leaves, because that's the deal. It's like a seesaw, right? When one is high, the other is low. When God is filled, in the sense that he's completely uh, there, then evil cannot in any way operate. But when God leaves, goes, then evil comes in and takes its place. I don't want to get into the whole formula, but it's basically called a reciprocal relationship. That's what it is. In any case, so as mankind sins, what's happening? The window is slowly closing. Until right before the Mashiach, where's the window? The window is one nanometer from the sill, which means that if shuts, everything disappears, everything. That's how bad it gets right at the end. Incredible example that the Ramchal uses in the Maimah Hagula, the safe and so on, right? That's what happens. So what he's saying is that the amount of evil that will happen in the end is akin to the window being one nanometer from the end. That's how dangerous it is, right? So what happens? Right before, and it's going to shut, because mankind's evil demands that it shuts. That's Midas Adin, attribute of justice. So all of a sudden, while it's heading down to the, to the end, right? All of a sudden, the house has a door. The doors fling open, and the divine influence pours in. That's the messianic era. That's it. So the world is not destroyed, because not only is there light, the windows don't open. The window shuts, but we don't care, because it now comes in through the doors, right? So the entire world is filled with the knowledge of God. I'm not going to go into that, but that's the analog, the analogy that he uses. Very interesting uh, uh, analogy and so on, you see? But the question, what the Ramchal says now is very interesting. He says, what does that mean? He says, when the window is down to a, a nanometer, right, then evil is no longer what it looks like. He says, uh, as the window is closing, then evil is called the Memtesh Shari Tuma, right? It's a 49 levels of Tuma, bad, evil, whatever, right? What is that about? That's mostly about Taiva, Taiva and, and Gaiva, or the, the normal sins of man. But when you're down to the bottom, it takes on a new form of evil. What is that form of evil? So the Ramchal says that is the Nun Shari Tuma, which is incredible. That is the worst, that's the end. What, what does that evil look like? So what's interesting is what the Torah says, this, the Torah actually brings down the four types of evil, right? It's going to characterize four types of evil. The Torah actually reveals the incidents of that. Okay, the first incident, right, is the Dor Hamabel. What's a Dor Hamabel? Flood, right? So a, a lot of it was caused by Gezel, but there's an interesting medrash which I once mentioned, and the major says this, what sealed the fate of the Dor Hamabel, the generation of the flood? Why did God destroy the world? You see? And the answer to that is very interesting. Because what the generation of the flood did is they didn't just sin. Their sins were sins in which would destroy civilization. And God will not allow that because he wants the world to continue. So God said, excuse me, you know, you want to sin, that's one thing. But don't destroy my world. And they were doing that. Why? Because they were stealing. There was no private property. It was, it was just a, you know, imagine all of a sudden, and that, and that, you're going to laugh when I, when I conclude this. But anyway, people were stealing left and right. I mean, everything was going on. But that's not what sealed the fate. 
What sealed the fate is this medrash, where the medrash says <clears throat> that uh, when a man would want to marry a man or an animal, he would have to write a ksuba. Can you imagine that? What does that mean? If you have to write a ksuba, that means it's legal. Yeah, it has to be recognized by the government, right? So God said it's one thing to have this kind of LGBTQ homosexuality. You know, it's one thing. But you want to legalize it and make it formally legal? Excuse me. That's the end of the world. There's no reproduction. It's crazy. That's sealed xera. So that's the first evil, right? The evil of, uh, of uh, perversions in terms of sexuality and so on, homosexuality. That's sealed xera. That's number one. Second incident. So that evil is about what? To defy the edicts of God. It's defiance. The Hebrew for it is perikas oil, right? To overthrow the yoke. We can overthrow your commandments. We don't want that. Don't bother me. Don't tell me what to do. I will not listen to what you say. That's perikas oil. To overthrow the yoke of God's commandments. That's number one. Number two, second idea. Right? Is the Doha Flogger. What did they want to do? Build a tower. Right? They wanted to kill God. Why else would you do a tower? They wanted to kill God. Right? Uh, so, again, it's about God, but it's not defying His commandments. It is about wanting to kill Him. Right? Why else would they build a tower? <clears throat> Third idea. Paroi. Moshe Rabbeinu says, let my people go. And Paroi says, what do you mean? who's God? I'm God, because the pharaohs held they were God. So Pari wants to replace God, right? And then finally, so what do we have? To defy God, to kill God, to replace God. So what's left? One more. You have to kill the ambassadors of God. Who are they? The Jews. Therefore, we find Nimrod throws Avram Avinu into Kifshan or Aish into a furnace, right? Which was incredible. Why? Because he realized who Avram Avinu was in the sense that Avram Avinu wants to introduce a new form of worship, right? That's the fourth evil. So we see something very interesting, that in the end of time, the major evil of the world is against God. It's all about God. It's not even about their own taiva in that sense. They're into defying God, His commandments, Right? They're into killing God, replacing God, and killing the Jews. That's it. That's the Nun Shari Tumor. You see? That's what it is. In any case, and it's amazing that the Torah actually tells us all about this. You see? Now let's check out the U.S. Today. Isn't it interesting? Right? I talked about Gezel, that they were stealing left and right. Well, guess what? If you need to shop, as long as you don't steal more than $1,000, they can't touch you. San Francisco, you know how many stores, big department stores are closing? Because the shop lifting is unbelievable. It's all gazel, And they don't care. You see? It's insane what's going on in America. Right? That's what's happening. So you talk about gazel. Then, of course, what are we talking about? LGBTQ. Right? Lesbians, whatever. I don't want to get into the old Rush Davis and so on, right? America is a country that is completely perverse. It's unbelievable. And, and, and it's not only perverse, right? Now, if you are not a homosexual, you are looked down on. And if you realize what's going on there, it's like, that's not only acceptable, it's preferable, you see. And it's all about, and then there's transgender, where they're telling seven-year-old kids, why not change your uh, gender? It's beyond belief what is going on. You see. So that's the, the concept of the Doha Flogger. Then they want to kill God. I don't know if you know it, but religion is dying in America, just like it's dying in, in, in uh, Europe, right? Europe, 90% of the p uh, churches are empty, right? That's what's happening. Nobody goes to church. The only one who goes to church is the tourist because they want to see the windows, all right? There's, no, there's, no, there's nobody praying in the churches in Europe. In America, America used to be 60, 70 percent religious, right? And now it's down to 30 percent. That's it. 
they don't, the, the, the amount of atheism is incredible, you see. You see, in any case, so then they want to replace God. The Democratic Party is paroi. Who are you? Who's God? I am the one who determines everything. The Democratic Party wants to destroy America, including Biden, who is obviously a puppet of the Democratic Party. They want to destroy America, turn it into a communist regime, where obviously it's a complete dictatorship and so on, right? In other words, they want to replace God. That's basically what they want. And there's, therefore there's a tremendous hatred of religion. Anti-Semitism is tremendously rising. Well, who's that? That's Avraham Avinu. So when you think about it, amazingly so, all four evils dominate America. And of course, America it really dominates, right, with abortions. They went crazy when the Supreme Court removed Roe versus Wade, you see. But if you think about it, it's just incredible how in 1973, they allowed a woman to kill her kid right up to the time of birth. You realize what that means? That's infanticide, it's unbelievable. How they can, and then the people that are saying, well within 24 hours, if a woman wants to talk to a doctor, they both decide, let's kill the kid after it's born. I, that's murder. Yet they were fine with that, <coughs> and so on. That's all part of the defiance of human life, and so on, you see. Any case, so that's what's happening. The evil that the Ramchal talks about now exists you see, and unfortunately, Israel always copies America. That's the problem with Israel, and that's what's happening here. The homosexuality and so on, the defiance and so on, of, in terms of what's happening in Israel. Uh, now, I want to tell you something, because the question we now have to explore is, wait a minute, America's supposed to get rid of all this? How? It's completely dominated by these forces. But I want to just talk about Israel first. You see, what really is going on, and this is the sakana of what Israel is in. You know, we think it's a war between who? Between the left and the right, right? Or we think it's a war between the Supreme Court, right, and the Knesset, right? That's really what the war is. No, it has nothing to do with that, really. Here's the bottom line, ask yourself, and you begin to realize, you know, <clears throat> this concept called the reasonableness clause, right? The reasonableness clause. What is that really? Let me tell you how idiotic that concept is, reasonableness, and that this person who instituted Aram Barak is a Russian Marusha, what he did. Why is it so bad? Because it can destroy the democracy. Take the Supreme Court in America, okay? What can they do? They can't make laws. They don't have the legislative ability. Only Congress can make laws. So what, what, what does the Supreme Court do? They can examine a previous law, which was already made, namely the Constitution, and is the Congress or anybody, are they adhering to this or not? In other words, they can only evaluate your behavior based on previous laws. But they cannot make laws. That's why America has three parts of their government, you see? What does reasonableness mean? Wait a minute. If the Knesset had voted for this concept called reasonableness, right, then I, I can understand that the Supreme Court says you're violating a law that was made by the Knesset. But the Knesset never made a reasonable law, right? They want to make a reasonableness law. Yeah, but wait a minute. You do not have the power to legislate. You do not have the power to make a law. So wait a minute. They are usurping the ability to make laws from the Knesset. That is not only, it's, it's not unconstitutional, there is no constitution, but it's absurd. It's anti-democratic because the Supreme Court is not voted in by the electorate, by the people of Israel. They're, they're selected in this ridiculous manner, you see, which is unheard of in any country in the world. So it comes out that the concept of reasonableness is completely anti-democratic. You see, because there's no law that you're violating. Who, therefore, and they can, a, a, a judicial system can only evaluate if you are adhering to a law. But if they could cancel a law because it's not reasonable, I mean, if you can cancel a law, then you can make a law. It's 
Oh, the only one who can do that is whoever has a legislative ability can do that. But the Supreme Court shouldn't have that. So along came Aaron Barak, and he said, well, there's a new concept called reasonableness. We, the great minds of the century, can actually determine, right? We are godlike. We can actually determine that what you're doing is not reasonable. Excuse me, not only is it not based on a law, who are you? Who are you guys? What are like they say? Are you a mob of Ashi? Who are, who are you? That you can determine what's reasonable, you know? You're basing it on your values. Who cares about your values? It's all left or atheistic or agnostic or whatever. You're going to tell us what's reasonable? Who made you the arbiter of what's reasonable? The whole thing is absurd. Yet he got away with it because the Knesset allowed Barak to do it because they, they realized that they needed the Supreme Court as what? They weaponized the Supreme Court with this crazy reasonable, this, uh, it's not a law, it's a clause. You see, that's what they did. So the whole concept doesn't make any sense. The whole concept of reasonableness is anti-democratic. There's no country in the world that has this ridiculous law. You see, because the Knesset never passed such a law. So what are you evaluating? Nobody's breaking anything. You know, and you, the solemnic, wise Supreme Court, who are you to decide what's reasonable or not? You know, I love these guys. There's 12 guys versus 120 in the Knesset. So these 12 guys are, are more seicheldig than the 120 in the Knesset? What an act of gaiva. What an act of, of, of hubris, as they say. It's beyond belief. Now, if that's the case, if the whole thing is insane, right? So why is there such a significant amount of people, right? That hold that if you remove the reasonableness laws, then you've destroyed democracy. What's going on here? That makes sense. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like literally, it's an Alice in Wonderland scenario. If you remember what Alice in Wonderland was all about, right? Off with his head, but why? No, 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 off with your head. It's like, it, there's no, it, it's a very famous allegorical book with the whole, it was against the British. The whole society was insane, right? Uh, so you, you can't believe what's happening. That's what's so incredible. Why is there so many people that hold you know, and they're willing to fight to the death. You see, you know, ah, you know, you know, let's have a civil war over what? You guys are destroying democracy. And what's the answer? Because it has nothing to do with democracy or anti-democracy. Nothing. It is a war of the era of Rav against God, and they realized that the only ones who can shield them and remain in power is the Supreme Court. It is a fight to the death. Who is an heir of Rav? What is an heir of Rav? An heir of Rav is a Jew who is a leader, not the regular Jew, right? He is a leader that nullifies Maimon HaSinai. In other words, of course there's Judaism, right? Right? But it's not the Judaism of the Bible. There's no bond or an agreement between us and God. Not at all, you see? Then what is Judaism? I'll tell you what it is. It's gefilte fish, right? It's matzah brai. It's knedlach. That's what Judaism is, right? Of course the Bible is great literature, but so is Shakespeare. You see, they want to remove the entire bond with God. And that's really what Judaism is. You take away Maimon HaSinai, we're like everybody else. Just, we just have culture, and that's it, right? That's what an heir of Rav is. And we all know the heir of Rav. The left is heir of Rav. This is their last stand, because they realize, uh-oh, we've just lost our major defender. <clears throat> because they are the ones, they've weaponized the Supreme Court by the reasonableness clause. That's why people are irrational. Uh, it doesn't make sense. I mean, Jews are smart people. What are they doing? But they realize that they're finished. You see? They realize that. And therefore, it's a fight to the death. And they even take a position which is irrational. That makes sense. You see, that's why. Again, why? Because what the Ramchal says, in the end of time, it is the war against God. Forget about anything else, right? Are we going to follow God's dictates or we war with him? We kill him, we replace him, we defy his commandments, 
right? That's what it's all about. Oh, you see, don't even think that it's a war between the right and the left. It's a war between the air of Rav, which is the left, and the government, which is right. Not that there, there are parts of the right that are air of Rav. Um, you know, don't think that the right is all tzaddikim. But certainly, the people that represent God and his Torah and his mitzvahs and so on, right? It's a war against them. They don't want to be dictated to by anybody else. That's what you're looking at. And it could, therefore, because it's a fight to the death, uh, you see, for the existence of either side, it can easily turn into a civil war. <clears throat> That's what's happening in Israel. Same concept. It's the Nun Share Tuma, the war of God. It's nothing else. It's not political. It's a war of values. That's what it is. Look, I'm just showing you by demonstrating what is reasonable. How unreasonable is the reasonableness clause? It's ridiculous. You think about that. And you should know there's no country in the world that can pull off that stunt except Jews. You know? Yeah. Because that's how much, when a Jew hates God, you can't believe the lengths that he will go to to destroy God. Anyway, I don't want to get too involved in that. Anyway, so the question now is, wait a minute. America, how is America going to do it? So the concept that I mentioned means that America will ultimately do what? The final battle between good and evil will be in America, not Israel. Although I mean, it is happening in Israel because the real enemy of the Jewish people is the Arab Rav. Uh, but the real battle is between, in America, as we will see, where do we, where do we look for a hint? That is the question. Now the question is, what's going on in America? It's insane. Because like I said, what's astonishing is the level of degradation, dissent. It's unbelievable. And like I said, you now understand. We are watching the Nun Share Tumor, which is what I began to introduce. The window is one nanometer from the sill. And that's why you see all these kinds of evil. Now, what's going to stop it? And now I want to explain what is going on in America. <clears throat> in last week's Pasha, okay, in last week's Pasha, Moshe Rabbeinu mentions the history. He goes through that they killed Sichon, king of, uh, Sichon, uh, what do you call it, uh, Og Melech Aboshan, and, and so on, you know. He mentions all that, the travels and so on. But then he mentions Haseir, the mountain of Seir, which we know is the inheritance of Esau, Moshe Rabbeinu says. But what was strange about what Moshe Rabbeinu said, right, is he calls Esau our brother. He didn't call anybody else our brother, right? But wait a minute. Okay, biologically Esau is a brother, that's true. But why would you call him our brother? He says it twice. He calls Esau our brother. You see? That's strange. Esau is a Russia. It's incredible. Esau wanted to kill Yaakov, right? He became obviously non-religious. He's no more Jewish, that's for sure, and so on, you know. Why would Moshe Rabbein refer, and this is hundreds of years later, after Yitz, uh, Yaakov and Esau, you know, several hundred years later, why would he refer to Esau from, Haseir, from Mount Seir as our brother? Was this an accident? No. Obviously, the Torah is divine. If Moshe Rabbeinu is calling him our brother, there's some incredible mystery here that needs to be revealed. What is that? Now, I've spoken about this in the past, but I want to show you, you know, uh, to a certain extent, what the results of this is. <clears throat> the real idea comes from in Parshish Chukas, in Revi'i. Moshe Rabbeinu sends a message to the king of Esav, or the king of Edom, because that's what he was called then, Edom, right? And this is the following, he says, listen, you know, we want to pass through your land, because we want to go up. Edom is near the area of Eilat. So if you go up from Edom, instead of going all the way to the Jordan, and then crossing, why do you have to go so far? You go straight up Eilat, right into Israel. 
So he said, uh, let us pass your lands. We won't, we won't invade anything. We won't trouble you. Just let us go in. He says that in Chukas, in Revi, right? But he says it in a very funny way. He says, Koyoma ochicho Yisrael. Thus says your brother Israel. There you are again, your brother Israel. Now we could say, well, maybe he's trying to butter him up by saying, you know, you remember we used to be brothers, biological brothers and so on, even though you're so far away, right? Okay, fine, right? Uh, so that's what we would think. No, that's not what Moshe Rabbeinu says. How do we find out what Moshe Rabbeinu really says? So we need to look, Rashi. Rashi says something which is absolutely stunning. And I dare say, most people have no idea what Rashi's saying, other than the simple meaning. Here's what Rashi says. What was Moshe trying to do, prove, by calling his brother? So Rashi says, Loma, why does Moshe Rabbeinu mention brotherhood? For what? Not because he wanted to butter him up, because he had a taina to Edom. What was the taina? This is what Rashi says. This is a Rashi. Uh, so here's what Rashi says. Mm. Because Moshe Rabbeinu says, you know, there was a decree that God gave to Avram Avinu that your children will be in the land that they don't know 400 years, right? And they will go out, they will be slaves there, the Inuit some and so on, and then they will go out. Fine. Who was the recipient of that decree? So we would say, well, obviously, Yaakov and his descendants, the Jews. So Rashi says, this is Moshe Rabbeinu, he says, you know who was the recipient? Yaakov and Esau. Esau also should have gone to Egypt and be, been a slave there, right? Because that decree that God said, what, for whatever, without going into the reason and so on, ha applied to Yaakov and Esau, the sons of Yitzchak. Makes sense. So what did your, fa your, your father Esau do? He's talking to Edom, right? He took the whole task of going to Egypt and he threw it on Yaakov and they said, hey, you do it, I'm, I'm out of here, right? So we had to become slaves because we, the Xero, formed the years of slaves, you know, devolved upon us. So at least do us a favor and let's go to Israel the normal way without having to go all around to the Jordan. You see, that's what Moshe Rabbein was saying. He had a taina, at least do us a favor. Right? We did you a favor. We took on the brunt of the whole zero of 400 years in slavery. That's what he meant, brotherhood. He, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Right? The gezera of God saying to Avraham Avinu, your children will be slaves in the land. Right? Abamesh, 400 years, for Inuit some, and they will afflict them and so on. It's part of the tikkun process. Isn't it? There's nothing that God wants more than to bring the tikkun to creation. He's not interested in all the advancements of civilization. God is fixed on that. He wants to bring the world to the end, the tikkun, right? And who's the one who does the tikkun? The Jews. So therefore, obviously, without going into it, right, the Jews had to go to Egypt, right? For what purpose? Well, we know, because they accomplished it. Remember when they stood at Mount Terah, right? They had made the Zoyama inoperative. So in some way, the slavery in Egypt would have taken the Zoyama and make it inoperative. And eventually they would have evicted it had they not done the sin of the golden calf. So it comes out that Asaph is part of the Tikkun process. It's amazing. Uh, what? Asaph is part of the Tikkun process? How's that possible? That, just follow the logic. <coughs> According to Rashi, which is really a medrash and so on. So we have to understand that. Why would Esau be part of the Tikkun process? Which means he was equal to the Jews. Because he had the same avoider. Isn't it? Isn't that incredible? And the answer is this. How many of us were there? Three. Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov. How many Imos were there? Four. Do you ever wonder why? Right? Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Why are there four Imos? matriarchs, and why are three patriarchs? And the answer is because what? Because they're really four patriarchs. Avram, Yitzchok, Yaakov, and Esau. Esau is an of. 
You know what kind of neshama he had in order for, for him to be a patriarch? You see, Esav was an of. In fact, what's astounding is the Medrash says that had Esav done his job, right? And what was his job? Ish Sadeh, to go into the field. It doesn't mean to go into the field and hunt. It means to go into the field, into the world, right? And withstand the evil of the world and try to make the world righteous. Kirov. That was his real job, right? That's part of the Tikkun process. And what was the process, the, the job of Yaakov? Yeshiva Holom. To sit and to learn Torah, to bring spirituality down. And Esau's job was to spread that spirituality into the world. That was both. It's very in interesting what their jobs were. You see? But what happened, of course, so Esau was an of. In fact, like I said, the Medrash says, had Esau done his job as a patriarch, then Yaakov would have had how many shvatim? Six. And Esau would have had six. You realize what that means? Esau would have had shvatim. Why? Because he would be at least the equal of, of, of uh, uh, Yaakov. And there's a Paneach Raza, who was a Rishim, that says if you look at the gematria of Esau, it's twice Yaakov with a Vav. Twice. Double. Why? So he says something incredible. That gematria means that if Esau had done his job, he would have been twice as great as Yaakov Avinu. Can we imagine what he would have been? What do you mean Yaakov Avinu? We don't even understand Yaakov Avinu. Esau would have beat him twice. He would have been twice as great as the greatest of. Could you imagine? And there's a tremendous amount to dwell on, which I'm not going to do. However, I've given many lectures about Yaakov and Esau. You can find them on my website, TorahThinking.org. But this is what we see, you see? Um, so what happened? Well, like anything else, Esau had free will. He rebelled, and that was it. He threw off the yoke. That's what he did. So Esau is the story of an of that bombed. It's what it is. That went off the derech, right? What do we call him today? I forgot what you call him in, in Israel, or whatever. You know, guys go off the derech, and so on. In any case, um, so what happened? So finally, Yaakov comes to get the brachas, right? And then Esav walks in right after that. I'm skipping a lot, right? And Esav says, well, where's my blessing? So Yitzchak says, excuse me, who are you, right? And Esav says, what do you mean, who am I? I'm your son, your firstborn. I'm Esav. And he started crying. Now, I want to tell you something. Yitzchak loved Esav. The Torah testifies for Yitzchak Ohev es Esav. He loved Esav, and he realized Esav was now gone from the Tikkun, which is the Ike Olim Haba, right? Imagine your son comes home and he says, I can't stand it, I gotta quit Yeshiva, right? And I wanna go leave altogether Judaism? Your heart would break, right? So therefore Yitzchak, imagine the pain that he had, because Esav was about to leave, and he was, uh, not leave, he already left, uh, but he was finished, because now Yaakov took the brachas which is a real tikkun, blessings of tikkun. So what did Yitzchak do? Brilliant. He says, wait a minute. There are two jobs Jews have. One is to do the tikkun through the mitzvahs. But what happens when they sin, right? So they have to suffer for a kapara, for an atonement. So you know, Esav, I'm going to give you the job that if they sin, you're going to punish them. You will persecute them. So you will bring a kapara to Yaakov. Wow. Because that's what they need. And since you're bringing Kapora, that's part of the Tikkun. So in that way, he was able to keep Esau in the Tikkun process. Right? Which is amazing. And therefore, he remained the brother of Yaakov. You don't realize what Yitzchak did now. But really what happened? So toward the end, right? <clears throat> you know, Esau, he wants to meet Yaakov. And he's coming with 400 guys to kill him. Tura says that, right? And Yaakov was, Vayira Yaakov Mi'oid, Yaakov was frightened, obviously. I mean, he's a, he was a gibor, I mean, he's not a simple guy, and so on, right? But Esav meets him, gives him a kiss. And Rabbi Shimba Yuchai he says, that was a real kiss. He changed his mind. He had a change of heart. Where do you see that? 
Because he says to Yaakov Avinu, Yehi lecha shaloch, let that which is yours be yours. Which means that even though I came to kill you because you stole my blessings, you can keep it. I'm moichlet. He gave it back to Yaakov. Rashi says this. Mikan hoidal abrochus. You see, that Esau admitted, right, to Yaakov, you can keep the blessings. That means Esau did tshuva. He was coming to kill Yaakov Avinu, right? Instead he did tshuva and he said, Yaakov, you get the brochus. You see? So what should Yaakov have done? He said, wait a minute. This doesn't make any sense. Esau is about to do tshuva, right? I got to push him to the end. How? I'm going to give him my daughter Dina. Dina was a very interesting girl. She was the Yatsonis, which means she would go out by Tetze, Dina, Lyricis, Oretz, right? Dina was the first Kirov, besides Avraham Avinu and so on. So what Yaakov should have done is given Dina. Dina would have straightened him out. She would have made him from Esav, because uh, he was right at the doorstep of being a re returning to Judaism. Now, you, do you have any idea what the significance of that is? I'll tell you. If Esav became religious again, right, he would have been, right, he married, Esav would have married who? Right? Dina. Because he would, Yaakov would have given Dina. But if he marries Dina, then they would have had Osnas. And Osnas married Yosef at Tzadik. So it comes out that the father-in-law of Yosef at Tzadik would be Esav. He'd be a father-in-law. Right? That's number one. Number two, could you imagine the joy that Yitzhak would have had that his son is back in the fold? What a keeper of aim! That, that uh, right, that he would have accomplished, Yaakov would have accomplished. And that anyway was always a defect in Yaakov, to keep it over aim, which I, I don't go into the whole thing, you know, and so on. But imagine what he would have b b brought to his father, Yitzchak, that Esau is now back into Judaism. And not only that, right, Esau became, who did Esau become? Edom. Who became, what did Edom become? Rome. There would be no Rome against the Jews. The whole human history would have changed, right? If Esau would have done tshuva. But Yaakov did not realize it, whatever. And the Bon Shalom is a bus call, came out and said, what do you mean? You should have given your daughter Dina to Esau. You see, <clears throat> which is incredible when you think about that. What do you mean give your daughter to Esau? Would you marry off your daughter to the mafia? Of course not, what kind of shidduch is that? So why is God having tarumas to Yaakov for not giving Dina to Esav? He's a Russia. Because of the fact that Esav was about to do tshuva. And Dina could have brought him back completely. So Abba Hashem said, because you didn't do that, then Dina will be abducted by Shechem and violated. That was an oinish. But why would the Abba Hashem punish Yaakov Avinu? Because that's, I'm telling you, what would have happened that Esav done tshuva. Anyway, so the story is, <clears throat> which is really amazing, because the Pusik right after the meeting, it says, Vayelech, right? By, um, it's a Pusik there. Yeah, that it says that, and, um, and Esau returned to Seir. Esau returned Ledarkoi to his derech, and he went to Mount Seir. So that it should have said, right, that he just returned to Seir. What do you mean return to his way? His way in evil. Because he didn't do tshuva. So the Baruch Hashem looks at Esav and says, you know, you want to do tshuva. You want to become part of the tikkun process, which would have saved the Jews so much agony, destruction, and sorrows. So therefore, fine. But remember one thing. The prophecy in the beginning of Toldos says Rivka was having tremendous problems. So she went to Shem Ve'eva, right? And they told her the prophecy but the last statement of the prophecy is Rav The older will serve the younger. Now it was never meant that the older should serve the younger by punishing him, which is what Yitzchak did. No. It meant that Esau would be part of the Tikkun process. And that's an Avua which is going to come through. Must be. That Esau must be involved in the Tikkun process. Even if he took a side detour to becoming bad and so on. Uh, so therefore the Baruch said, because you want to do tshuva, in the end of time, you will do tshuva. Not only that, you will help Yaakov do the tikkun in the end of time. There you are. 
we are now back to understanding. <coughs> so wait a minute, the end of time, I told you the birthday of America is what? Is Shiva Asa Thomas? What's happening? There you are. Who is a reincarnation of Edom, Esav, right? Is Trump, which I've said many times. People don't realize Donald Trump is a reincarnation, really, not of Esav, but of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, who is a Roman Empire, who loved Emperor, who loved Rebbe. The Gemara talks about Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, the Gemara, the Torah calls him, and Rashi brings him down many times, that he is the perfect partner to Rebbe. The Jew, Rebbe, and the Emperor of Rome, Antoninus. And Antoninus is a Roman emperor. You know what a president of the United States really is? He's a Roman emperor. You even have the same symbol, the eagle, and so on. <clears throat> In any case, so Donald Trump, as far as I'm concerned, is Antoninus. Come back, and he will solve the problem. The evil, right, of the window closing. Now, did this happen? It's incredible. Donald Trump, and it's interesting how it started, in June, 16th, Donald Trump came down the escalator, right? And he declared he's running for president, and everybody cracked up. He was the comic relief of the election. That's who Trump is, right? Everybody said, it's impossible. Not only he has no experience whatsoever, he's running against the most famous woman in, in the world, this is uh, Hillary, right? It, forget about it. He has no experience, no, no diplomatic experience, He's a businessman, everybody left, and he's running against 16 heads of state, senators. I mean, it's impossible. But I'll tell you something. On June 26th, 10 days after this guy ran down to the escalator, the Supreme Court said, Anthony Kennedy, Russia, that the 14th Amendment says in the Constitution that you cannot stop a man from marrying anybody he wants. There you are, LGBTQ, started 10 days, right? And they've been arguing about it for a while. So finally, after 10 days, the world resorted to the Dharmabal. Not only, remember I told you what sealed the fate? That if you want to marry a man or a behemoth, bestiality, you got to write a ksuba. That's exactly what happened 10 days after he was running, or he declared his candidacy. You think that's an accident? What was the problem? Because Kennedy, being the fifth guy to vote for it, constitutionalized LGBTQ. You realize what that means? It means you cannot have charata unless you have a constitutional amendment and so on, which will never happen. You know how difficult that is and so on. So what he did is he enshrined in the Constitution LGBTQ, homosexuality, lesbianism, and all the other garbage and so on. Right? That's what he did. But when the Rebbe looks at this, what are you doing? At least you could have charata, but you can't, because it's constitutional. And therefore, I must bring Ace of Edom out, and he's going to begin the change. And therefore, I realized about a month after he came down, that wait a minute, who is this Trump? It's a, it's a, it's a joke. <clears throat> but I realized, for whatever reason and so on, that this guy's Edom, he's Ace of coming back. Rav Yav he's going to be tremendous for the Klai Yisrael. And that's exactly what happened. He was tremendous, right? He's the greatest president in the United States, history, right? To be behind Eretz Yisrael. I mean, think about it. You know, the Golan, Yushalayim, well, he stood up to the Arabs, it was incredible. All the things, if you recall, you know, how he stood up to the Arabs, he stood up to the UN. It was like he was in love with the Jews. And the truth is, he is. The Russian made sure that he would know who the Jews. First of all, he gave him billions of dollars, so he's going to have to now defend himself with all the lawyers because he's being indicted. He's a very, very wealthy man. He was in real estate, and we know who's in real estate in New York. It's all Jews, right? He made sure, not only that, Ivanka, right? She's Jewish. She's going to have a bar mitzvah. You heard that she once, he once went over to Ivanka and said to him, you know, I want to become Jewish. So she said to him, what do you mean you want to become Jewish? Well, because the Jews, they're great, right? So she said to him, excuse me, you can't become Jewish. 
So he said, well, why not? So she said to him, who am I going to sell my chametz to? <laughs> I don't know if she really did to say that, but we see that he loves Jews. It's incredible because he defied American interests in the things that he did. <clears throat> Therefore, Trump is really ace of doing tshuva. In fact, it's always interesting to look at him. He's always red. He wears red ties. I mean, it's a, like he, he's got a complexion of red and so on, you know. <clears throat> but people say, what do you mean? How could Trump be a Gilgal of Esav? He's a Balgaiva. He's a Baltaiva. Come on, right? And who are you talking about? The former Esav used to be a Nov, right? But I tell him, you're making a big mistake. Esav had three meters. Tremendous Gaiva, tremendous Taiva, right? and so on, but he's also a fraud. He's an imposter. He's Meshachir. He fooled Yitzchak, right? Trump, whatever, if he's a guy and a taiva, but what Trump is not is a fraud. He's honest. He's honest. He tells the truth, and he genuinely likes people, whatever. That's the main media that Esav had, which destroyed him, is Murama Bepeh, as they say. Like it says in the Torah, he's a fraud, imposter. In any case, and that's what he's done. We see what he's done. Now you may say to me, wait a minute, and I spoke about this once, you know, wait a minute. If Asaph, if Trump is a Gilgal of Aurelius Antoninus, right, then how come he got booted out by Biden? What happened? Why didn't it end? Right? Which is a very powerful problem in terms of. Biden and, and, and Trump. You know what the answer is? I look at the Chumash. It's got all the answers. When Moshe Rabbeinu, who is Moshe Rabbeinu? He's the Mashiach. God appointed him to take the Jews out. That's the Messiah. And then to give the Torah, right? That's the Mashiach, right? Uh, yeah, what happened? Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Parai, right? He says, let my people go. And Parai says, you know, they're lazy. Now let them gather straw which means he enormously intensified the suffering of the Jews for months, you see? But why? In fact, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't, himself didn't understand that. He ran back to God and said, Why have you done evil to these people? What was the problem? Now, Moshe Rabbeinu certainly was right in that sense that, what do you mean? I don't stand. You send me to take them out. Me, I got worse. But what Moshe Rabbeinu unfortunately made the mistake was, wait a minute. You can ask God, why are you doing this? Because it seems to contradict what you sent me for. But he didn't do that. He said, Loma hare oiso. Why have you done evil to this people? That means he judged God to do evil. And Grashi brings down the whole thing. And you can't do that. You cannot be Mahari after his midas. You cannot in any way ascribe what God does as being evil. We don't understand why. That was the mistake Moshe Rabbeinu made. But in any case... <clears throat> He certainly was perplexed, and the truth is, you know, why did God do that? And the answer is this, because if the Mashiach comes because the world has reached Memtesh Shari Tumah, the world has reached the 49th level of Tumah, and what we see now is entering the 50th, right? Remember what I said about the Ramchal? Therefore, wait a minute, the Messianic era is a glorious era, unbelievable, no death, Everybody's wealthy, it's incredible, right? It's called utopia, right? Much greater than utopia, you see. So guess what? The Sutton, he gets up and he has a right to because he defends justice. He says, wait a minute. They're in the Memteshari Tumor. The Jews in Egypt are on the 49 levels of Tumor. You want to bring the Messianic era? Come on, you can't do that. They don't deserve it. And he's right. Because he has to defend justice. That's what the Sutton always does. He's the angel that defends justice. Din, this isn't justice, right? You want it because they're in the 49 level of evil, fine. But how can you give them the Messiah which will enormously glorify everything that they go through? And the Bansham says, you're right. So what does the Bansham do? He has to satisfy justice. That's the key. If the Mashiach comes because of the 49 levels of Tumor, then the Sutton goes bananas. And God has to justify, he has to justify, satisfy justice. Therefore, he has to increase enormously the suffering. 
That's why. Because they were supposed to be there 400 years. But the problem was, if they stay, they're only there 210. And if they stay another year, they're going to fall into the nun Shari Toma, and they can't be redeemed, and so on. Therefore, God said, I got to get him out now. That's life, as they say, right? So therefore, he said, but I have to satisfy justice, because the something is right. I have to enormously intensify the suffering. And he did that by having Paroi decree that you guys have to get straw at night and then build the bricks in the day. That's why. So what do we see? That if the Mashiach is going to come when the world is reaching nine, nun shari what's God going to do? Who's screaming his head off? The Satan. So God has to satisfy justice. You see? That's why. So God says to the angels when he's holding court in that sense. He says, okay, Trump started the process in its four years. It was fabulous. The economy was great. Everything was doing fabulous. And his relationship with Israel was incredible. But I got to stop it. Because there's something that's screaming. There's no justice here. And I have to, I am God. I have to follow justice. So God says, okay, I'm getting rid of Trump for a while. So the angels look at God. And they say, excuse me. You can't do that. It's impossible. He's the greatest president of all. Everybody's got a job. They're making money hand over fist. Our stock market's going wild. The economy's incredible. How are you going to get rid of the guy? So God looks at the angels and says, I don't have any problem. I'm God. Watch what I do. So what did God do? He destroyed the achievements of Trump. Number one. How did he do that? COVID. That's why COVID came. COVID destroyed Trump. If it wasn't for COVID, Trump would have Zika won the second time. But COVID destroyed all his achievements. The economy went south, as they say. All right, everything changed. Everybody had to stay home, right? People were dying left and right. And not only that, COVID not only destroyed Trump's achievements, right? <clears throat> but what it also did is it allowed Biden to hide in his basement and campaign from his basement so nobody saw what an idiot the guy was. Right. <clears throat> Nobody realized how demented he is or he was deteriorating. Not only there's also terrible, ah, what he has done to America is beyond belief. Nobody realized what this guy really is. You see, that's what happened. COVID destroyed Trump. Why? Because God, but, but there's a second concept. What is that? Not only does it destroy Trump, right? But it puts in a completely incompetent person, you see? And more than that, he's a Russia. He's a very evil person, Biden. Why? Because you have any idea what's happening with the immigrant situation? It's not just that the immigrants are coming in. Fentanyl is coming in by the tons. 130,000 Americans die every year because of the fentanyl. They say it's all over the place because of the cartels. But Biden is allowing that to happen by bringing in, well, how could you bring in fentanyl and kill your own American citizens? You're a murderer. That's called Masayla Ritzicha. Because you could stop it. That makes Biden a murderer. You have no idea what's gonna happen to him when the wheels of justice, when God finally says, okay, your part is over. I'm bringing back Trump, right? You have no idea of what he's high of, right? Because and I, I, tragically, I spoke to somebody whose son died from fentanyl. You, you, yeah, it was terrible to hear the grief. His son, 30 years old, died from fentanyl, right? Who's responsible for that? Uh, and so on. This is what Biden is. Not only is he demented, is he incompetent? He's a Russia, he's a murderer. Uh, you see? I mean, a desire to put climate change over oil when the whole country is going bankrupt and so on, is incredible. <clears throat> anyway, but Biden ser serves a purpose. What is the purpose? To stop Trump, to satisfy justice, that America is now suffering from COVID, right? Nobody has a job. The inflation is killing everybody. The gas prices, guess what? That's real suffering. That's what the motion has to do, you see, in order to satisfy justice. And that's what he did. But it's ending 
And why? So the good news is what? Is that Biden, everybody's seen through Biden, that he's really, he's either got Alzheimer's or whatever he's got. Not only that, they see the evil that this man has done. Uh, you should know one thing. If Trump loses or lost, it wasn't because of Biden. They hate Trump. Who's doing this? Who's getting the United States to hate Trump? Because it doesn't make sense. <clears throat> hey, you don't like the guy's character? Okay, so he tweets too much, or whatever he does. Okay, so you don't like his character, but his competence is incredible. Look what he did to the US. So how could you be more worried about his character than his competence? He's one of the greatest presidents in US history. You look at Biden, you may think he has a great character, but he's an absolute moron the way he runs the country. Think about that. So America is actually voting for who? For Biden? Because they hate Trump? Why do you hate Trump? Nobody understands that, you should know. America is gripped with Trump obsession mania. They hate the guy. Uh, this hatred has never happened before. You don't like a guy's policy is one thing, but the hatred that half America has for Trump is gut. They hate his guts, you know? Visceral hatred, but why? You know what the answer is? Because you are looking at Esau fighting Esau. There's the Rashab Esau, which is the Democratic Party, right? It's a Democratic Party. It's the liberals, the progressives, the left, that are trying to destroy, right, normalization and society. And then you're looking at the Toiv Shab Esau. Esau, who was doing tshuva in that sense, right? But why they hate each other? You're looking at a war of Esau against Esau. But who's on the side of the evil of Esau? The Sutton. We don't realize the Sutton is dying. Right. You don't realize that. 98% of his strength is gone. He had to give it back to the Jews without getting into the whole Kabbalistic understanding of how he derives strength. 98% of the Sutton is gone in terms of his strength, he's dying. If he real, and he realizes, if Trump gets in, it's over with, then he will contribute to the tikkun of the Jewish people and his reign is gone. That's the end of the Zoyamah. That's what he realizes, you see. Uh, so therefore, as the Yates Sahara, which he is, he's influencing everybody to do this stupid thing. What are you so concerned about his character? His competence is off the chart. Biden, you may think he has character, but he's completely incompetent. So what are you voting? You see, you realize one thing. Do you know what the most dangerous thing in a democracy? Is the people who vote in the democracy. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Half these people don't even know who the vice president is. Maybe they do, but anyway, you know. It's incredible. The people who vote in the democracy, most of them have no concept of who's running. They don't know because they're too busy trying to make a living, right? They have to survive. They don't have time to check out these crazy senators and congressmen if they're doing their job or not. You see? That's why. This is the problem. <clears throat> so the Sutton in his power as a Yetzirah, where he can convince you, has convinced half America, right, that Trump is crazy. Trump is evil. Trump is going to destroy democracy, right? Why? He was incredible as a president. What does that remind you of? Same thing going on in Israel, right? Reasonableness, right? If you take that away, it's going to destroy democracy. It's the exact same irrational <laughs> Taina. I mean, okay, you, know, you don't like Trump, fine, fine. But how can you argue against his policies? America was doing phenomenal. China, Afghanistan, this... The, the, the Ukraine would never have happened if he was president. Everybody knows that. It's, it's insane when you think about that. What is wrong with America? How can they do this? Are they crazy? You know, you'd rather have Biden that's more interested in climate than inflation or anything like that? Do you know that 70% of America cannot make a living? Are you aware of that? They cannot pay for the budget. They don't have the money. They cannot make ends meet. 70% of America. You believe this? And they're still voting for Biden? Are they crazy? It's amazing that he's got a 38% a, a whatever the rating is now, right? Why would 38% vote for Biden? <laughs> for what? 
Uh, how stupid can you be? But that's the problem with democracy. Because people don't have the time to investigate. You see, are these people doing a good job or not? That's the problem with a democracy. In any case, so what's happening now? So we realize there's a war going on between the good part of Esau and the bad part of Esau. And the Sutton is desperately trying to get everybody to vote for Biden, because Biden is his man, right? He's destroying America, right? He's getting everybody to believe in the LGBTQ, right? Transgender, all this evil nonsense, robbery, Crime is up like crazy, right? Everybody, they're anti-police. They want to defund the police. It's insane, you see? And this is all Biden, what the Democrats are doing to the cities. New York is dying. It's California. LA is dying. You know, it's incredible, you know? But I'll tell you something just as an aside. Why? Because the Jews have a unique feature. Always into Ferris. The Jews have a unique feature called Oiz, might, and beauty. It's, and it says that when the Jews sin, where does the Oiz and Tiferes go? It goes to the Goyim. You see? And it says in the Pasuk, Ad Mosai Uzchu Bashvi, how long will your might be in captivity? The Sif'atcha and your beauty in the hands of the enemy. If you remember in the beginning, Esav, when Esav was up, Ulaim Ulaim Yemotz, right? They're never equal. When Esav is up, Yaakov is down. When Yaakov is up, because he's doing the will of God, then Esav is down. Right? That means the Tfers and Oiz that are the inheritance of Yaakov varies. Depends if they're doing the job. So if Yaakov, and a, uh, Yaakov is up, then he has the Tfers and Oiz. What is Tfers and Oiz? Oiz is might, success, tremendous success. And Tfers, beauty, is Chochmah. All of that will go to the Goyim. Uh, right? If Yaakov is down, then Esav is up, he gets it. But what's happening now? The wheels are shifting. The Hatzlocha of the Geula is going to the Jews. Why do you think Israel is such an incredible startup nation? Uh, and so on. Where do you think this comes from? Because the Tiferes and the Oiz, the might and the beauty, right? The success and the, the Chochmah is going to the Jews. But wait a minute. If it's going to the Jews because Yaakov is up, then it's got to go down for the Goyim. Well, what is the Tferes and Oiz of America? New York, dying. Los Angeles, dying. San Francisco, dying. City after city that the Democrats have is deteriorating and dying. And the shoplifting is beyond belief and so on. Why? Because the Tferes and the Oiz of these cities in, New York, in America is now going to the Jews. This isn't an accident. Everything is understood when you understand the blueprint of the Bria and so on. <clears throat> but what's happening now, it's incredible, right? They're trying to destroy Trump. Why? Because a Sutton wants to destroy him. Because he realized if Trump gets in, he's going to enable the tikkun of the Jews in Israel because he's going to get back on board. Sutton doesn't want to do that. He's got to keep the Zayama in your body, right? Or else he's finished. So he's behind the tremendous obsession against, right, these people, the maggots as they call them, right? But the left realizes they must kill Trump, not literally, maybe, but they have to destroy him. Because if he becomes president, what do you think Trump is going to do? Every one of the Democratic Party has committed a felony. He's going to go after every one of them. Not, it's not so much revenge, because they are destroying America, and they know that. So they must put him away in jail for the rest of his life. That's why the whole thing is insane. If you examine the indictments, it's, it's almost, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be laughable, right? They say he took documents, but wait a minute, Biden took 1,000, I think, 700 documents as a senator and as a VP where it's illegal for him to take it out of the White House, you see? And what did Trump do? Trump was the president, he could take it out, you know? And so on. I'm not, I don't want to go into the, all, all the things, but when you look at the judicial, the, the indictments against Trump, you, you have to laugh at this. This, a former president of the United States? Why? Because the Bosham is taking out Biden. That's why. You are looking, looking at the end of Biden, except the Bosham is doing it slowly, because that's what Biden deserves. He's a murdered Russia, what he has done. You haven't had people, somebody has 70% 
that 70% of the country cannot make ends meet? Do you have any idea what a guy, a guy goes to sleep and he knows he can't pay his bills? Do you have any idea how much anxiety the guy has? Suffering? Every nekudos point of suffering is an oinish to Biden because he's causing it. We don't realize how strict God is with justice that he will go after you even if you are 300 people away from the original event. But if you are in the causal chain of a bad event, you are judged at that level of causality and so on. So Biden is guilty of murder, even if it's indirect and so on, you see. But we see that Biden is dying in that sense. You know, Not only is God taking away his seichel, which is a tremendous oinish, and so on, but what the Bansham is also doing is he's holding him up for mockery. Do you know what it is? A president of the United States takes bribes from Ukraine, from communist China? That's treason. That's literally treason, you know? And it's coming out every day. They find out more and more people whistleblowing. I don't want to get the whole thing, but every day there's another charge against, another accusation against Biden. That's why the motion allowed the Congress to become Republican. You know, even if the Senate is not, uh, and so on, you know, because the, the House is the one that investigates. And they, they can't, you should know one thing, they cannot believe the amount of violation of laws that Biden and his family, I mean, what's going on with his son, Hunter Biden, and so on. I, mean, I don't want to go through the whole litany of what's happening, but we all see Biden is dying. His reputation, not only, he, he, the, uh, Biden's lucky. Why? Because you cannot remove Biden. Even if you impeach him, you can, right? But the Democratic Party doesn't want him removed. Why? Because they're going to get the VP, Kamala Harris. And Kamala Harris is an absolute buffoon. I mean, you ever listen to this woman? And everybody knows that. Uh, she just was honored with getting the lowest approval rating uh, for a VP in the history of the United States. That was the honor. Yeah, they just came out with that. She got the low, I, was, I think it was, a, it was a minus, you know? The lowest rating of a vice president in, in American history, she got it. Because everybody sees, what has she done in the two and a half years? But when she talks, you say, excuse me, what? What'd you say? You know, they realize, what is this woman? It's astounding how she was attorney general for California. And we all know how she became attorney general she provided services for many people get, without getting into that and so on. So Biden is lucky, because if they get rid of him, guess what? They have Kamala Harris. And I believe if she ever became president, you would have a civil war. Why, why would we allow ourselves to be ruled by an absolute moron? Right, very dangerous. Anyway, so which is very good, because we see the wheels are changing. That's the important thing. Just like in Israel. Do you know what happened in the nine days in Israel? It's a tremendous simon and people don't realize that. The nine days are the worst days for Jews. Yes? But do you realize that on Monday, which is the nine days, they voted to remove the reasonableness clause? So they defanged the Supreme Court. Didn't they? But it happened in the nine days. Hey, wait a minute. These things don't happen in the nine days. It's the reverse. That's the muzzle. The muzzle is changing. In the nine days, if it happens, that's the muzzle changing. You see? And people, I have seen nobody that has mentioned that. Because they don't realize. Because like I told you, it's the war of the air of Rav against God. That's what it is. So in the nine days, a tremendous simon is that they have uh, been de-weaponized and so on. And it's not only that, it's not only in, in, in Israel, but in America, it gets worse every day from Biden and from Hunter and all that, uh, you see, <clears throat> which is very, very important. And of course, like we say, they're trying to kill Trump because they realize if he becomes president, that's the end of the Democratic Party. And I believe that what the Republican wants to do is destroy the Democratic Party. Why? Because they are guilty of destroying America. But the problem with America is the beacon for the entire world. Think about that. So in essence, they have contributed to the erosion of morality throughout the entire world, and so on. And I believe that the Russia wants to destroy the Democratic Party. But who's gonna do it, right? Why do you think uh, Trump keeps getting indicted? 
because the Bonisham is stoking the fires on Trump. He wants to get him so hot to kill these guys. I mean, they've made him look like a schmata, like an absolute idiot. A president should be indicted three times, and he's zikha going to be indicted by Georgia, which is going to be the fourth time. And so for what? You, uh, see, because God is stoking his fire. He wants to make sure. And that's why DeSantis is losing big time. Because DeSantis made a terrible mistake. He's a fool for running against Trump. First of all, you didn't need to. You already have a competent guy like Trump. What do you have to run? You know, it's just an act of, you know. And not only that, he's 44 years old. Wait. Wait till you're 48. What's the rush? Uh, you know? And why are you doing that? What are you going to do is split your party? It was an idiotic move. And he's suffering. Uh, because he's now going to be labeled as a guy that lost. I think Trump, the latest poll was he up at 60, and DeSantis was down at 19. That's a slaughter. So what do he need it for? Fine, okay. Uh, but, uh, but you see that Trump, every time he gets indicted, he goes up. He collected $35 million just for being indicted. It's unbelievable. What, that, that's, not, that's not normal. It's not normal. A guy is indicted three times, right? And he goes up in the polls, and he gets more money. Yes, you know who, who's responsible for that? The Rabbani Shalom. It's an act of God. The Rabbani wants to make sure that he will be the President of the United States because he must destroy the Democratic Party. Look, before the Geula, everybody gets paid back what they did. And this is their payback. The Rabbani says, you destroyed Asaph, you destroyed the world, you made it immoral. It's incredible what America has become. I must destroy you before the Mashiach comes. That's justice, you see? But who's gonna take out the Democratic Party? Trump, because he's fuming, he's infuriated what they did, and we know Trump. Trump is like, you know, he's respect, and he holds himself to be, can you imagine doing this to Trump? He never forgets a slight against his character, <clears throat> you see? And therefore, he keeps being indicted. And the Democrats don't realize, the more they indict him, the more he's gonna become popular. Are they crazy? because they're so desperate to stop him. They cannot even think of what in the, in the world that he's doing and so on, you know? Therefore, we now realize that the good news is that the wheels are changing, both in America. It's incredible the, the parallels between Israel and America, you know? Be the last battle of good and evil, right? Is, is, which is what's going on here. Then the irrationality of the tightness, you know, of reasonableness, right, versus Trump and so on and so forth. It's all, you know, and the incredible thing, which you've never seen before, it is the greatest scandal in American history. You know what that is? The DOJ, the Department of Justice, the CIA, the FBI, the IRS, and the White House are all after Trump. Could you believe what that means? The entire American government is arrayed against one man. That's not normal. And they're all liars. They found the FBI. Nobody believes in the FBI anymore. It's a fraud. CIA, the IRS, with how they've, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, resisted, uh, what do you call it, investigating Hunter Biden, right? And the DOJ. But you know what's even more interesting? You think that the air of Rob is only in Israel? Who's the head of the DOJ? Merrick Garland. Jew. Who's the Secretary of State? Tony Blinken, a Jew. Who's the head of the NSA? Sullivan, a Jew. Who's the head of the, 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 uh, the Senate leader? Chuck Schumer, a Jew. Excuse me, what is this? It's, a, it's like a Jewish cabal. Uh, it's all Erev Rav. What's the amazing thing that the Erev Rav is all over the place because they're dying. And you see, when you really think about that, the parallels here are just be incredible. Mm. So that's really the good news, what's happening here now and so on, you know. Uh, and America is falling. We see that. I mean, the morality of America is in the, is in the pits. It's in uh, sounding. The cities are dying. The morality is dying. You know, even in the, uh, in the army, they're more interested in woke than they, are, than they are in the ability to fight. Can you imagine an army you know, that is only interested in, well, are you woke or not? You see? It's, it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and we see that even America is turning against this woke philosophy. I mean, Anheuser Busch, with uh, what, what do you call the name of their beer, uh, uh, Miller, Bud Light, what? Bud Light, Bud Light. Bud Light, right? You know, uh, last time I heard, they lost eighteen billion dollars. You have any idea what kind of s loss of sale that is? It's incredible. Why they are taking on positions of politics? It's stupid. You see, but that's how much the Sutton wants to destroy Trump. But that's really what it is. It is a satanic war backed by the air of Rav to destroy Trump. Why? Because Trump is a messianic figure. <coughs> and that is why I believe that Shiva Asabatamas is the birthday that America is the last battle, you see, in order to bring, to help Klai Yisrael, right? Klai Yisrael do the Tikkun. They are the last place. And therefore, America has to be born, which is where it's going to take place at the time of the greatest disaster when the Jews allowed the Zoyama to re-enter creation. Nothing is an accident, you see. And what Trump is doing, what is happening to Trump, has never happened before. The entire government is after him. It's never, it never happened. And they're all faults. They're all frauds. They're all guilty of felonies. All of them. The FBI, the DOJ, the IRS. I mean, when you hear the, the stuff coming out by Congress, you can't believe. What have happened to the American government? And then the White House is filled with lies and so on. We are watching the end. We are watching the window down to the nanometer. That's what it is. And I told you what the evil of the nanometer is. It's a war against God, disguised as some type of, you know, philosophical debate. <clears throat> That's what it is. And this is all what's happening, you see. Uh, so look, let's hope that Oid, very shortly, the Bershom is going to say, enough is enough. My children have suffered enough. I need to stop this. And we have no idea what the ghoul is. I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> the ghoul is not where all of a sudden God throws out these guys. That's the first stage of the ghoul. Where Biden, Harris, DOJ, all of this collapses. The Democratic Party, the liberals, the progressives. The Bosham is going to take them all out. You know, so we think, wow, what a redemption. No. The redemption is we will be returned to being like Odom Mauritian before the sin. We cannot even begin to imagine what Odom Mauritian before the sin was. And the Medr says that the Malochim, he was, he was so impressive, so great stature, that the angels started singing Shira to Odom Mauritian. Could you imagine? What do you mean, an angel? We have an idea what an angel is? You know, they're off the charts. And they think Odom is God? So they're singing Shira to Adam? Yeah, that's how great he was. We will return to that situation. Could you imagine what we're going to look like, right? What's going to happen in that era? And remember one thing, it says, you know, and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God, which is a very interesting concept. God will dominate the earth the way the sunlight dominates the earth in daytime. We have no idea what that is. And if you think Egypt, right, Mitzrayim, they had incredible miracles. Could you imagine? The whole Nile River turns to blood. And believe me, the Red Cross could have used that blood. Because it was real blood. It wasn't colored water. It was real blood. I mean, I don't know what type it was, but it was real blood. Uh, you see? Could you imagine seeing that one miracle, what you would have thought? It's unbelievable. And so on, right? <clears throat> the, what will happen in the end will make Egypt in pale in comparison. Right, that's the miracles. So the beginning of all of this is to remove the evil. And we are looking at that now between the evil of Esau and the good part of Esau fighting to the death. Just like we watched in Eretz Israel, the era of Rav and the people who are ambassadors to God, right? They are fighting for stability and for existence. That's what's happening. So let us hope that this is, right, the last term of evil, and that we will see the Mashiach, hopefully, before Rosh Hashanah. Thank you. Yes,